This morning we dismiss our children to children's worship uh, with Miss Danita, uh, four years old through fourth grade today. Big bunch of them today. Well, good morning. Good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to take them out and turn to the... Looking at the, the Christmas story and uh, the title of the series that uh, I've entitled it is Simply Christmas. So we're going to be looking at some things and the first thing today that we're going to be looking at is something simply impossible. Uh, there's a lot of things at Christmas time that you would deem impossible. Uh, some of you right now are saying it's impossible for me to find the right gift for a certain person, right? There's people that are hard to find to buy for and things like that, and it's impossible to find that. Some of you are thinking at Christmas time, it's impossible to be able to afford all the gifts that I'm supposed to buy. Uh, you're budget stressed, and you're trying to figure out how am I going to do the things I'm supposed to do. Some of you today are thinking it's going to be impossible for me to find joy this Christmas. You're looking for joy, and with things going on, you just can't find the joy that Christmas is supposed to bring. And then for some of you, you're just trying to find a way to go on. It seems like it's impossible for you to find a way to go on. Maybe you've went through a difficulty or struggle or loss or something like that. And Christmas seems like it's impossible to you. Well, today, I want to give you some hope. Today, I want to look at the Christmas story because the Christmas story was about the impossible. It was about God stepping into this world in a magnificent way and doing something that was impossible. It was humanly impossible for Christmas to happen. It was physically impossible for Christmas to happen. It was biologically impossible for Christmas to happen. It was simply impossible. In fact, as I, as I was thinking about the physical side of Christmas and the biological side of Christmas and the natural side of Christmas, for, for the Christmas story to happen, all that had to God had to intervene in that. And we know what the true Christmas story is all about. Amen? And so hopefully we can look at this passage and these passages and, and try to find some, some truth that we can hold on to. Because probably there's some things in your life right now that seemed impossible. And we're stressing about them and we're worrying about them. And we're trying to decide how am I going to get through this Christmas. And God says, but I can do the impossible. You know, our scripture today is the story of the virgin birth. Now, to believers, it's something we've heard. If, if you grew up in church, you've heard about this every Christmas since you were a little child. We talk about the virgin birth. And as we grow older, it almost gets to the point where it's just, we don't even think about what God did at Christmas time. And we get caught up in the things of this world and, and, and let me tell you something right off the bat that you have. I want you to think about this. Put your thinking caps on. You know, the virgin birth is one of the foundations of our faith. Without the virgin birth, we would not be here today. And we're going to get into that today. And we're going to learn a few things about the virgin birth. And I want to grab a hold of the story of this. And hopefully today, for some of you, it may give you some hope that you need the courage that you need, the strength that you need to face something that's impossible in your life. We know that God, with God all things are possible, amen? And I hope that you can agree with that today. So today as we read this account, I know that I'm going to read something you've heard a thousand times before, but I hope and pray that you can grab a hold of it and think about what happened at this moment in time and why we celebrate Christmas. So would you all stand with me as we read this today? Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. 
But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let us pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this time reading your word and looking into your word and the truth that it holds. Father, I pray today that each and every one here would have their hearts and minds set on you. That, Father God, you are the center of attention today, God. That you are the reason why we're here. That, Jesus, we believe and know that you are God's son. That you came, born of a virgin, in a stable so many years ago. Jesus, we thank you that you not only were born into this world, did you live for us, you died for us. Thank God you rose from the dead. Father, we pray for anyone here today that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they would accept Christ and that free gift of salvation that only he can offer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this all. Amen. Please be seated. So from the scripture today, we're going to look at the virgin birth of, Mary, of Jesus through Mary. You see, first of all, the virgin birth of Jesus includes the announcement of the impossible. It includes the announcement of the impossible. In verse 26, we see the story begin. It's Mary going about her business, going about her day, and Gabriel intervenes from heaven with a message from God. It says in the sixth month, look at verse 26, in the sixth month of the angel, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Right off the bat, we get the picture of what's going on here. The sixth month, what is the sixth month? It was a sixth month of Mary's relative Elizabeth's pregnancy. She had a child in old age. She was barren. God did the impossible, went to her husband Zacharias while he was in the temple serving, and the angel Gabriel said, you are going to have a son in your old age. God began to do the impossible in an amazing way. And then in the sixth month, while she was pregnant with John the Baptist, Gabriel came to Mary and was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, I want to make a note here. It's okay as we portray angels in all of our um, nativities and things like that. I have nothing against girls and ladies being angels. But in the Bible, as you see them, Gabriel had a masculine name. And, and so I, I chose that, that, that Jared would, uh, would help us portray that today. Because in our minds, you know, that Gabriel had the, a masculine name. So we, we picture angels our way. But God had sent Gabriel, his archangel, to deliver this message the announcement of the impossible to a virgin. Verse 27, that in itself, a virgin betrothed to a man in the house of David, whose name was Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. We know the story of Mary and Joseph. We see it every year at Christmas time. But Mary was a virgin. She was already betrothed to be married. And it wasn't just that she was engaged. It was that she actually had already been given to, to Joseph. A betrothal period in the Bible was much more than just an engagement that could easily be broke off. It, it, it had uh, legalities to it. In fact, after that, that happened, there had to be an actual divorce in order for it to be broken. And, and the only thing that, that they lacked was the period of time that they waited until they came together in the sexually intimate way that they consummated the marriage. They was already betrothed to each other. So it's different than what we see today. 
So Mary, uh, she was a virgin. She was already committed to Joseph uh, as his wife. And, and so we see that picture of the virgin named Mary. Uh, why is that so important? We're going to see why that's so important. Why we have to hold to the doctrine of what the Bible says. In verse 28 it says, And having come in, the angel Gabriel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The announcement began. Gabriel was standing before Mary. Mary was probably in, in, in all sense of the, the, of the scripture. She was scared. She was nervous. She didn't know what to go on. I don't know about you, but if you were at home minding your own business and an angel of the Lord shone uh, uh, his face up upon you, before you, how would you react? You'd probably be scared to death, right? You didn't well, know. What, what type of greeting is this? Has the angel came to, to, to say, it's, I'm calling you home, God's calling you home? Or, or what kind of word is this? So Mary was troubled about that. The announcement of the impossible brought many feelings and emotions and things like that. Just like Christmas does for us. For some of us, the emotions are high. For some, they're low. For some, they're excitement. For some, they're disappointment. All these different things happen at Christmas time. But Mary was human just like us. You know, the announcement was going to be something amazing, unbelievable, supernatural, impossible. That was the announcement to come. In verse 31, Gabriel says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, just as I said, that was impossible in Mary's mind. How, how could this happen? She questions, we're going to see here in a moment. The impossible was about to happen. Something amazing. Something unbelievable. Something new, supernatural. Something that we look back on and take for granted that everything just happened. When in fact there were many factors going on at that time. There were many things that we have to consider when we consider the announcement that God was going to send his son. I believe also the virgin birth of Jesus includes the opposition to the impossible. The opposition to the impossible. What do I mean by that? Have you ever seen a time in your life, in your family, in this church, in your Christian walk, when God doesn't get ready to do something amazing, supernatural, spectacular, unbelievable, that the devil doesn't try to get into it? H have you ever seen the devil not try to attack a church that's trying to do God's will and, and God's purpose? H have you ever seen in your life, when, when God is doing a work in your life, that there's things that don't happen that try to discount and discredit and, 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 and confuse you about what God's trying to do. We all face those things. You, you want to see what happens? Get close to God. Get serious about serving God and see what happens. Now, whenever God is doing something, there will always be opposition from this world. You know, this world, what does this world do with God? This world mocks God, does it? Don't, don't they? This world mocks God. It makes fun of Christians. It tries to, to put us aside or, or act like we're, we're crazy or, or we don't know what we're talking about, like we're, we're simple and we're just, we're, we're, our faith is a crutch. The, this world tries to make fun of Christmas. It tries to laugh at the fact that we celebrate Christmas for a reason totally different than the world does. We celebrate Christmas because of Jesus. I thank God that here a while back, this political correctness of not saying Merry Christmas has kind of started to go away. Because there's no sense and no reason why at Christmas time that I can't tell someone Merry Christmas. Amen? Amen. If you haven't said that yet, you need to be saying that to everybody. Now, now they have generically started, you know, when you're at a shopping store or something like that and you're checking out, you know, you always listen to what the, the checkout person's going to say. And a lot of times they'll, they'll kind of shy away from it. But more times than not now, they'll say, Happy Holidays. But I love to hear when one of them says, Merry Christmas. Is that so hard to say? Is there anything wrong with that? But the fact of it is, the world mocks Christmas. It mocks Christianity. It mocks God himself. Just like it did in the day of Jesus when he was born, it does in the day that we live. So the opposition is of this world. Jesus said if this world opposes you, against you, uh, against him, this world will also be against us. So we need to expect that. Also the opposition is from Satan. This world mocks God, but Satan hates God. Satan despises God. Satan cannot stand, Satan is a counterfeit and a liar. 
Anything that God does, Satan opposes, and he tries to set himself up and mock what God does. Anything that Satan tries, that God tries to move, Satan tries to get in the midst of, mix it up, stir it up, and stop the movement of God. You know, Satan himself is a liar and a thief. He hates God. He hates a movement of God. He hates the truth about Christmas. You know what Satan would like to do? He would like for each and every one of us to not really know, understand, and tell the true story of Christmas. And I think he's done a pretty good job of it many times. You see, from this world, we will have opposition. From Satan, we will have opposition. But there's somebody that will oppose you more than you ever realize. Do you know who that is? It's yourself. You are more against yourself in the flesh, against God, than you'll ever realize. When Jesus himself had to go and pray and fast and be ready because when temptation would come, he had to face it, turn away from it. We read in the Bible that Jesus was tempted and we think, well, Jesus, he could face anything. Well, he could, but he had to be prayed up. He had to be ready to go and he had to spend much time with God. So I believe a lot of times in our own Christian walk, we're not ready to face the opposition of ourselves. We talked about prayer and fasting. We're not ready to do God's will because we're not prayed up and we're not willing to fast to get ready for what God wants. You see, ourselves... The world mocks God. Satan hates God. But many times we question God. There's probably some things here right now that you'd never admit. You really try to put to the side, but you kind of question God on some things in your life. God, why did this have to happen? God, why can't this happen? God, why am I here? God, why is this? And all these things question God. God, can I really believe what your word says? You see, Mary herself had, she was human. Mary had to overcome her flesh. Mary had to overcome the obstacles, the world. The world says that's scientifically impossible for this to happen. Biologically, this can't happen. Mary, it said, and and, you know, we have to be careful because we don't want to read into the scripture and it says that, you know, Mary had fear. Of course, you're going to have fear when God approaches you with something like that, with an angel. I would say if an angel would show up here right now, we would probably all fall down right before say, you know, Lord, what are you doing? And the angel would say, I'm not the Lord, but it would still be reverent fear before, before the Lord. You see, I think the opposition sometimes is ourselves, and Mary was just like us. You know, in verse 29, look at that. Gabriel began to speak, and when she saw him, when she saw Gabriel, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting was this, And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. How many times in your life have you faced what seemed to be impossible and you've just needed God to reassure you that everything's going to be okay? How many of you in your life right now can look back at times in your life and you know that you were fearful, you were troubled, it wasn't that you didn't fully trust God or you didn't, didn't know that God was in your life, that you weren't saved, you weren't a Christian, you believed in God, and you knew you were saved and you knew you were a Christian, but you just kind of questioned and, and maybe doubted a little bit and were confused a little bit and a little fearful, and then all of a sudden God comes through and proves himself to you. You know, if the Christian walk was nothing but just an easy walk in the park, and, and it's not, is it? Can anybody in here say that your walk with the Lord is just easy? It's just gotten so easy that everything's just a piece of cake? That's the worst thing that can happen. In fact, when new people get saved, new believers, I always try to call them a couple, three times over the next few weeks, and I always try to encourage them, and I always try to set them up to realize, you know, you're on a high here because you gave your life to Jesus, but just look out, it's going to be tough. You will be opposed on every side. You will have to face things in your life. Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect. But Mary knew deep down that even though she was troubled and facing opposition, God had spoken to her very clearly. The virgin birth of Jesus included the announcement of the impossible, included the opposition to the impossible, but also, and here's a point that I really want to grab a hold of. It, it, included the necessity of the impossible. 
Now, what do I mean by that? It included the necessity of the impossible. There are some things at Christmas time that you deem necessary. There are some things that uh, are a necessity. Some of you say that we have to have certain gifts, we have to have certain places we go, we have to have certain foods that we eat. All these things come in, but the first Christmas, the announcement of Jesus coming into this world, the virgin birth, was a necessity that we have to hang our foundation of our faith on. What do I mean by that? If you don't get anything else, this whole message, I don't know if you're listening or not, I hope you are. Without the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, your salvation is worthless, hopeless, and of no avail. Did you get that, guys? Shake your head if you're with me here, okay? The, without the virgin birth of Jesus, now, now the world tries to say, oh, that really didn't happen. Can, can you really believe the Bible? Maybe, and you even have Christian teachers in seminary and things like that that try to explain away virgin birth, the parting of the Red Sea, all the miracles of God, all the impossible things that only God can do, when in fact, if we explain away the virgin birth, if we play down the virgin birth, if we forget the virgin birth, your salvation is of no avail. Why was it so necessary for Jesus to be born of a virgin? There is no salvation apart from the virgin birth. This is not fictional. This is foundational. Without the virgin birth, the rest of our faith would crumble. Why do I say that? We well, see, we know and understand. Now, I, I don't want to say understand. Do you believe today... Or do you even think about the fact that Jesus was fully God and Jesus was fully man? Have you ever heard that concept? Jesus was fully God and fully man. Now that blows my mind away. I, I can't understand that. I can't. Darren, can you understand that? No. No, no don't, don't look at me with your pink hair. You can't understand that. <laughs> Did everybody notice Darren has pink hair today? Praise God. Praise God for that. Darren, why do you have prank hair today? Uh, I lost a challenge. Oh, he lost a challenge to the youth, but that was a good thing because they got so many youth to come for so much time and they got to pick Darren's hair color out. And it's already starting to fade out. I liked it when it was really bright pink. I think. Dark brown? Okay. That's another challenge all of itself. <laughs> you see, we can't understand how God. Jesus could come and be fully God and fully man. But without that, we don't have salvation. Why do I say that? Because he had to be fully God in the flesh, but he had to be in the flesh. But he couldn't be uh, of the flesh because of the flesh is sinful. Jesus had no sin. The, the song says he became sin who, who knew no sin that we might receive his righteousness. If Jesus wasn't fully God... If he wasn't perfect, if he had the sinful flesh, now he was born of the flesh, he had the flesh, but he had no sin. Are we not born into sin? Doesn't the Bible say that we're born into sin? Now we're all guilty because we're born into sin. Jesus was God. He was born of the flesh, but he wasn't sinful in the flesh. Without the virgin birth, we don't have that. Jesus was just born like you and I. And Jesus was born a sinful man like you and I. And when Jesus died on the cross, he could not be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. But Jesus came fully God and fully man. That is something that was a necessity. Jesus was deity, yet he was humanity. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. It's what it says. Not of, not of Joseph, not of a man, conceived of the Holy Spirit in her womb. It was God's plan from when? From before the foundations of the earth. Now, I'll probably say this in a later message, but just because Jesus was born of a virgin and born in Bethlehem and born of him in the manger doesn't mean that he just came to life. Because if you read the scripture, Jesus has always been. From the beginning, uh, before the beginning, till after the end. Jesus has always been. But at that moment in time, the necessity of God coming in the flesh, fully God, fully man, deity meeting humanity, conceived of the, of the Holy Spirit, was a necessity of the Christmas story. You see, the necessity of the impossible. There's things in our life that are necessary. There's things in our life that you think are necessary that are really not. How many of you have experienced a time in your life 
when you thought something was absolutely necessary that you had to have or do or whatever it may be, and it, it went away, whether it be by, by God's design or whatever it may be, and you realize, I can go on without this. I don't want to. I don't have. I, I, I can't stand it. Maybe. Maybe you realize that it, something was better. Maybe it was worse. But in the end, you've realized that it was a necessity. Now, Lisa said something earlier, and I know she didn't mean anything by it, but I just cringed at it. I'm sorry, babe. This church is never, and I know she didn't mean it this way, but I just, I have to say this, this, this service, this church, nothing is ever about me. Because if it ever becomes me, I'll be the first one to say, I'm, I'm stepping down, I'm done, because it's not about me, it's about God. And so, and I, I try to say that humbly, and I know exactly what she was saying. If God called me home or moved me away in the future... This church will go on because I'm not a necessity to this church. Now, I have to say that knowing that now I'm not saying anything here. I'm saying if that happened, if, if God moved you, if God did something in your life, everything that we think are necessarily have to be for life, that sometimes we find out or not, this church would go on. This church may thrive more than all. I, it may be that God would, would move in a way that he never had before. I don't know. But I do know this. When you think about Christmas, just think about this. All the food you think you have to have, all the gifts you think you have, all the money you think you have to spend, all the things that you think are going to make you happy, all those could be gone. And if you have the virgin birth of Jesus coming into this world, the necessity of all necessities, you have everything that you need. For some of you, that's a challenge because you're so wrapped up in the things of this world, you don't realize that if all that's gone, if I have Jesus, I still have everything. The necessity of the impossible. It was going to be impossible for God to come into this world this way from our minds, from a physical perspective, from a... If, how many of you had Mr. Burris in school? Okay, many of you did. Many of us did. He taught for like 40 generations, I think. Mr. Burris, he taught us much more than we realized. He was a hard-nosed teacher, but you walked out of there and you knew a lot more than you knew before. But what I appreciated, Mr. Burris taught science. Mr. Burris, and Gordon, I'm sure that you, just, you and Mr. Burris loved each other and got along just perfectly right. No comment. Okay. Mr. Burris had a way about him that sometimes he would just rub you wrong or he'd irritate you or he'd try to make you look like a fool. He had, in his science classroom, he had a chair sitting up front. Right now, if, 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 one, if a teacher did this now, you would probably be in jail. You know what he had? He had a dunce chair up front. A chair called the dunce chair. And you know what happened? If you got in trouble or he didn't like you or he got under your skin, he would bring you up and sit you in that chair and he had a cap, a dunce cap that he'd put on. You remember that, Freddie? Oh, yeah. Did you know about that, Mr. Sansom? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, yes, yes. Yeah, tur turn, see no evil, hear no evil, think no evil, right. Yeah, okay. Well, we were lucky. Freddie and I can relate to this. We were lucky. You know why? We got into this physical science class, a required class we had to take with Mr. Burris. And we get in there, and a poor fella, and I'll go ahead and say his name because he ended up getting along really well later, but Bobby Looper was in our class, and he got under Mr. Burris' skin right away, and he got into the dunce chair the first day of class, and he didn't get out of it until he graduated out of that class. So it was pretty full the whole year, wasn't it, Freddie? They went on to be good friends. They, so, so, I mean, everything was good. But what I'm getting at with this, Mr. Burris, as much as he knew about physics, about science, about chemistry, about biology, all these things that he taught us that we didn't even realize he was teaching us because he was so brilliant. You could never argue a point with him because he would come full circle and make you think, well, I just don't know anything. But, but Mr. Burris, he would talk about creation. He would talk about evolution. He would talk about all these things he, that he had to talk about evolution while because it had to be taught in schools, in the books. And he would say, but we all, he would end this way. He'd say, but we all know that's a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> Mr. Burris was a Christian follower. He was a Catholic. He followed Jesus. And Mr. Burris knew the truth. And, and, and the virgin birth was necessary. And, and creation is necessary to our faith. And, and so all these things that seemed impossible became possible with God. The last thing I want you to hear today, the virgin birth of Jesus, the announcement of the impossible, 
the opposition to the impossible, the necessity of the impossible, but the bottom line is the acceptance of the impossible. Verse 34, Mary says what every one of us would say in that situation. Look at 34. Mary said to the angel, how? How can this be since I do not know a man? She was betrothed to Joseph, but they had not had sexual relations, and she, had, she was a virgin, how can this be? I, I hear what you're saying, but how can this be? Physically, biologically, scientifically, this can't be. And so she asked the question, how? How can this be? And I want you to hear me on this. The truth is, there are many things in this world and in our lives that we accept without completely understanding them. Did you hear me? There are many things in your life that you accept by faith and you really don't understand them. What about electricity? You know, my son is a substation electrician troubleman for Amber and Power. So my, my son knows a lot about electricity. And he blows my mind. He, spent, he was trained for three years on how to do his job and all these different things. And he was about, he goes out and he works on things like hundreds of thousands of volts, you know, coming into this. Bruce, he sends my, my wife pictures of him closing a circuit and it goes, <laughs> it looks like a Frankenstein movie because it scares her to death to see. But I guarantee he doesn't know everything about everything about everything about everything about electricity. Let me ask you this. Do you know everything about electricity? It'll bite you. That's right. You know enough not to touch it, right? Okay. Let's say that we take the virgin birth and everything about Jesus and Christmas and all that, and let's say it's really hard to believe that story. It's really hard to believe that God can do the impossible. It's really hard to believe the virgin birth, and, and so I can't accept it. Okay, you, you don't understand completely electricity, but do you sit around in the dark? I don't understand it, so I'm just I'm gonna sit in the dark till I understand it. I'm just gonna stay in the dark because I don't understand electricity. I, I don't know how when I plug this thing in the wall, it charges it up, and I can watch my TV and, and, and charge my phone and all this. So I don't understand it, so I'm just not gonna be a part of it. How many of you climb into a car, drive a car down the road, and you really don't understand all there is to know about a car? You don't understand, you just know that when you push the brake, it's supposed to stop, you push the other pedal, it's supposed to go. You don't understand how that exactly, ought. some of you probably know a lot about it, but maybe not every detail about every second of everything. But does that keep you from driving a car? What do you do? You operate by faith. I don't understand electricity, but I'm not going to sit around in the dark. I believe that they're going to come on, and I believe that, you know, it's, it's a power. And so we take it by faith. The world will do that. But when it comes to Jesus and the virgin birth and Jesus being born, God in the flesh, we take that, and, and we don't, but people do out in the world, and they question it, and they say, how can that be? It's impossible. And they won't accept because they can't fully understand. If you wait until you understand Jesus completely and God and his will and his ways and his salvation, you will never be saved. I can't understand how God did that. I know the concept and the stories and I know exactly what happened, but I don't know. I, I know that it happened, but I don't know exactly what all had to transpire. The truth is there are many things in this life that we, even as Christians, fully understand, but we accept. We don't understand, but we accept. How about the story of Christmas? How about nature? Let, let me give you one here. We're about to close. We under, understand the physics and the logic and biology and, and nature. We go out and, and we expect that when we go out into the duck blind at a certain time of year, Gary, there's going to be ducks migrating south. Right, Jeff? Supposed to be. Supposedly, that's supposed to happen. It's not happening very well right now. But that's something that we don't understand. What is it inside a duck that makes them fly south? Or any bird? It just by nature, they do that. We don't understand all of nature. You can look at any animal and you understand, why do they do what they do? It's just by nature they do those things. Well, why, do it, why does deer go into rut at a certain time of year? I don't know. It's just biologically, it's the nature of the deer. But 
But God stepped out of heaven through his son Jesus and was born of a virgin. You know what that tells me? We serve a God that is not bound by this world and by nature. Amen? We do not serve a God that is bound by nature. Why? God created it. He's not bound by time. He's not bound by the limitations of this world. He's not bound by anything that we're bound by. God can do anything he wants, any way he wants, any time that he wants. He can step into history, step into time that he's created and, 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 and send his son into the, the, this virgin to be born. You know what Mary had to do? Look at what it says over here in verse 37. Gabriel says, for with God, nothing is impossible. Gabriel came from heaven. He had seen God. He was before God uh, day after day after day for his, it, it, the entire eternity. He knew nothing was impossible with God. But as us, as, as, as humans, we have to accept that sometimes we can't explain and understand all there is about God, but God can do the impossible. Mary said, look, behold the maidservant of the Lord. She says... I, I'm God's servant. What God, whatever God wants, this is what I'm going to subject myself to. She knew the consequences. She was betrothed to Joseph. She was going to be showing a child. She was, could have been labeled as, as a, a, a adulterer and killed for what she was about to do. But she trusted God to do the impossible. That If God can do this, he can, he can take care of all these problems. And Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me... According to your word. You see, how do we accept the impossible? We say, I'm a servant of God. No matter the consequences, no matter the cost, no matter what it's going to be in my life, I'll do whatever you want, God. To accept the impossible, God, you're asking me to do something that I can't do. No, God says, but I can do it. Because with me, nothing is impossible. Let me ask you this. As the musicians come, do you believe that God can still do the impossible? We ought to be a little more excited about it than that. Stephanie, we ought to be so excited. We know God can do the impossible, can't we? Can't he? Amen. Bruce, we know God can do the impossible. Lisa, we know God can do the impossible. Melissa, we know God can do the impossible. We've seen it. We see it in the Bible. We've seen it through time. And we've seen it in our own lives. God has done some impossible things in your life. And you don't even realize it. But right now, you're challenged. You're, you're questioning. But you've got to believe that God can do the impossible. Do you know believing the impossible is the only way that you can be saved? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you're listening and you haven't accepted Jesus, I'm not talking about knowing the Christmas story, knowing and believing Jesus was a virgin birth, but I mean believing that Jesus died for your sins, that you're a sinner, you're separated from God, and God stepped into, out of heaven into, into this world, and Jesus lived a perfect life and died for you and rose from the dead. And if you haven't put your faith and trust and belief in him fully, saying, I, I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I fully trust in Jesus, then why not today? Maybe by fully believing the impossible, it will allow you to trust in God and rest in God through something that you're struggling with right now. Maybe it's a miracle that, that only God can do, and you're praying for a miracle. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's direction. You're looking for direction. You don't know what direction to go. And, and you just need, to, God can do the impossible. And, and here's your servant, God. And, and whatever direction you want, that's what I'm going to do. I don't know what's going to cost me. I don't know what it's going to take. People may shun me. They may, may want to stone me to death. But here's your maid servant. Here's your servant. Remember, you don't have to understand everything to accept the impossible. You just have to believe that God can do it. You may not even know what that impossibility is, how it's going to turn out. But this Christmas, how about 
we do not lose the fact that the virgin birth proves that God can do the impossible. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. We stand on your word today and we give you the honor and glory that you deserve, Lord. Father, I pray today for anyone who needs Christ that they would just believe that they may think their sin's impossible to forgive. It's not in Jesus. For the believers here today, some struggling, some trying to get ready for Christmas, some missing out on the, what Christmas is all about, or, or maybe just a, something that they're struggling with in life in general. And we just need to believe the impossible. That no matter what the next steps were, no matter what happens, God, that you're going to be there, you're going to provide, and you love us, and your grace and mercy is sufficient for whatever it is before us. Thank you, Jesus for doing the impossible through Christmas. It's in your name we pray. Amen.